I'd like to hand over to Carl Greenwood, who is going to be speaking on reframing art to cultivate a thriving cultural ecology. Carl Greenwood is the director of First Art, a charity and creative people and places program working across Ashfield, Mansfield, Bolsover and North East Derbyshire. Thank you. And now to Carl. Hi. Sorry, I've got um, a bit of a, a dodgy neck, so if I look really weird and awkward, then that's because I'm in a bit of pain, but I'm fine. And um, I will be looking at my notes a lot and trying to do three, four things at once, which my brain can't handle because someone said my brain's a bit like a pinball machine. Um, but anyway, my name's Carl Greenwood. Um, I don't have to look at my notes to know I, what, what my name is. Um, so I've been working in the arts for about 20 years. I'm a bit of a failed, well, I am, I am a failed musician. My entry point into the arts was buying a left-handed, buying an upside-down bass guitar when I was 14 for 14 pounds. Um, and that's, I got into music and went to uni and failed <laughs> in that respect, but then obviously kind of made my way in, into the arts. Um, so I'm now the director of um, First Art. I hate the name, but that's a, 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 a different conversation. Um, we're a Creative People and Places program. Um, I'll just mention where we are in, in a bit. I also used to be the director of Appetite in Stoke, which was also a Creative People and Places program. So Creative People and Places has been, has been going now for about 10 years. Yes, yeah, it's, it's 10 years anniversary. So I started in 2013 in Stoke. There's actually 40 projects now. Um, and Creative People and Places is an um, Arts Council um, England strategic national program um, in areas where arts engagement is well below the national average. So as you can imagine, some of the places such as Hull and Stoke-on-Trent and um, Wigan is now a part of that, that program. Um, it's about more, putting more investment in those areas and how a program over a long... I mean, one of the beautiful things about Creative People and Places is that Arts Council have invested into it over a long period of time, which is what we're talking about, things dropping off the cliff edge. I think that's really important. Um, just to, I always have to stress this, I'm no expert in any of this stuff. I'm just telling you some of my learning, my findings, my feelings, some of my frustrations, which might come out. I've tried to start the year optimist in an optimistic mind, but actually speaking to people today, I think I've been quite negative. Um, we cover four districts, which I'll talk about prob turning problems into solutions, but we're, we're a very small team. We have to cover four districts, um, including Mansfield and Ashfield, which, yeah, creates its own problems. But I always say if one if someone shuts your door in one district, you can always go and knock on the door in the next one. So it's quite useful in that sense. Um, we're, we've just set ourselves up as a charity, um, which I think is really important in terms of sustainability. It, it was a nightmare um, to set up, but we finally got there, um, which obviously puts in a stronger position moving forward. Um, yeah, and it's just about future-proofing what we do. I'm not going to go over these points. Um, similar to what Mandy said, the um, slides will be going out, so I don't need to go into too much detail. But I think for, for us, really, a CPP program is there to support, but also challenge what's already there. And that can be quite a difficult position to be in, because I'll talk about it a bit later, about people in, can be in a comfort zone. So... Um, I think that's really important and also to, for people to recognise us as a cu key cultural asset, which is takes a lot of time. You've got to build those relationships, but I think we're starting to get there. Um, and obviously about those connections, a lot of the stuff we've already talked about. And when we say an asset, um, we don't just mean the programme. I mean, you could call me an asset or someone in my team an asset, but I think you've got to think about what power you have and what you can bring. So... Um, every day we kind of under, try and think about what you know, what asset, what are we bringing to the table, and then the interconnect interconnectivity of culture with, to fit other agendas, which I feel is one of the most difficult things to do because we're all so busy, and that's something we've already addressed today. Is that how do you know about everything that's going on, not just across four districts, but in, just in Mansfield alone? Um, I'm not going to go through all this, but for me, obviously, the sustainability and joining up the networks is is kind of a, a really important thing that we want to improve upon. I'm not saying we're doing that very um, great at the moment, but I think all the partners um, in the areas that I work in 
want to do that. It's just finding the time to do it. Um, this is a model that is a kind of work in progress, and it's what we are talking about earlier about first person and how you start from a person or a community and work up rather than starting with a policy and a strategy and working down. Um, it, it's open for interpretation, but we, you know, obviously the most important thing when we're working with communities is building that relationship. Um, I'm a Yorkshire guy who doesn't live in a lot of these communities. Like, who in the hell is this guy from the art, arts coming in here telling us, talking to us about what, you know, you've got to be... Uh, you've got to kind of be aware of that outsider syndrome, which we, you do get it. Um, but I use that as, again, turning problems into solutions. I think as an outsider, we can reframe, we can look at things a bit differently. Um, people can kind of get a bit sucked into their own um, lifestyles. And, and, and it's just about zooming out a little bit and being a bit objective. And I guess ultimately, we're really interested about the new partnerships, the new assets, the things at the top. But I think it's... Um, really just kind of an, a way of us kind of depositing what's in our head into a, into a diagram. And I know it's, there's, there's, it's open for interpretation, but that for me is quite useful to thinking about person to policy rather than policy to person. Um, so we do all sorts of stuff. I'm not going to go into details. We did a light night. Um, we've done community cinema, which is part of a producing program that we need to develop more, done, work with illustrators on their um, creative packs. We've done secret picnics. We use food a lot because um, food, people come for the food, not the art. So that, we shouldn't be called first art. It should be food food first. Um, we've done festivals, um, workshops, and we've done a Sunday roast cabaret, which was in interesting where you get a, a Sunday, free Sunday roast dinner and whilst you watch some cabaret, which was a nightmare. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so this goes back to um, what Mandu was saying about need. When we speak to communities, we've just tried our, in our own way, and it's all very internal at the moment, um, to how, how do you break down, how do you build this paradise? It's quite useful. So when we did, um, we worked with an artist at an event and stealthily did some consultation. Um, and we asked each family or child to write what a perfect party would be in terms of music. So each one got a jigsaw piece of so people that wrote egg, egg mayonnaise sandwiches. We couldn't do it all. It'd have been a weird party. But the idea was that people would just, it, this was only a small part of the event, but it was just about finding ways for people to, if we were going to run have a Christmas party, what would it look like? And, and then we took that and then put on an event afterwards. So it's really important how there's a lot of artists in the room, how we can use artists and what they're good at to kind of get the answers that we need. Because no one's going to come to an event and say, do you want to come to our community meeting where we're going to talk about future events? I mean, there will be some people, but it won't be that exciting, especially if I'm doing it. Um, but yeah, we break down, we, we, we try and break down the need of a community by, you know, some people want to learn skills and develop skills for themselves. The community that we're working with in Bellamy really are keen on not bringing people in and them being the ones. Whereas a lot of communities that we work with, they don't have the assets or the meeting spaces. Or, so social cohesion is a massive problem because there's nowhere for people to meet. So it's it, it's just try, try to understand the needs and then think once you do that, um, it can be really useful. We also, in each of those, in each, uh, across a number of communities, did a community and cultural life survey and asked some really quite boring questions, not boring. We had quite a detailed survey, but actually that brought back loads of really interesting data about how satisfied people were with um, the green spaces in their community or, or um, how, how prou proud they were of their community. And actually that helped us get, lo not loads, that helped us get some funding. So it's really, we can share that with people because it's a, there's a framework of a, um, uh, a survey that we did, but we want to kind of build on that because actually that gives you really important data. Um, Cultural, again, I'm no expert on, on any of this. And maybe ecology, ecosystems, cultural infrastructure. I'll just flip between the, I don't, well, we talked about language is important, but in my opinion, we kind of know what I mean. <laughs> um, the ecology is obviously about how humans or we interact with our physical environment. So this, is, again, is just something that I was, what's really important. We talked about people and partnerships. Death, that for me is the key to the having a successful infrastructure. Um, the resources investment, 
obviously having space and buildings is important. Um, but systems and structures, if you don't have the people making the meetings happen or people coordinate, I mean, you know what it's like to coordinate a meeting or get people in a room. So having those systems and structures in place, and we talked earlier about mechanisms for artists to come and speak to people. I think that's really important that sometimes you have you can have all these in place, but the systems and structures kind of um, cut out certain people. But obviously the key thing for me is the communication and connect connectivity between all these things. You can have a, an amazing building, but if there's no people um, going into it or using it, or there's, there's no systems to kind of help it run efficiently, then it's not going to work. So when we talk about assets, we, I think a lot of people talk about tangible assets and someone mentioned earlier about um, the, the skills and the knowledge and the wisdom that they have. And I think that's not, then that, that's not necessarily recorded or documented. I mean, it's really hard to capture the wisdom of a community, but it's there. Um, whereas it's much easier to kind of record the physical assets. But I just think that's really important that I would say this to communities that you have so much more, um, you have some, not not sounding patronizing, but they have so much more they can offer and give um, and they don't often know. And it's about our job to kind of like, instigate that and kind of say look what you know and do is amazing and and it's about not what's wrong with you but what makes you strong um and then obviously assets can be broken down into um different things um i'm not going to go into this but again when we're talking about the need it's it'd be it, from our point of view we did do this last we did do this but anyway it's it's, it's a bit out of date now um about scanning an area and understanding where the opportunity... So this is also not just about evaluation, this is about planning. So understanding that actually these wards or communities, there's no the personal development opportunities are really... There's not much going on. Or, you know, in some certain communities, social cohesion, there's nothing happening for communities. So it helps us plan and develop and have a conversation. But obviously, you need the data to do that. Um, and I think another thing about assets and is having an honest interrogation of you yourself. I mean, I'm highly critical of first art myself um, and I'm holding that mirror up and not getting complacent. Um, and I think sometimes people aren't, you have to be quite brutally honest about where you are and where you need to go to. Um, I went to a whole city of culture. Ooh, I went to a whole city of culture um, meeting years and years ago when they were unsuccessful and then they were successful. And they said, what we did was that we, we were kind of, we, we kind of fooled ourselves that we were ready. They said, we weren't ready. And um, we had to go back to the drawing board and did an assessment of, so basically the green is like, we do this really well. I mean, this is just an, an example, um, but innovation, for example, we're not in it. This is in, in, this bid isn't innovative. So how can we get from, how can we turn that red into an amber or a green? So they, they shared this with us about, we kind of went from that to that. And also being realistic about what innovation means. Um, innovate, nothing against Mansfield, but innovation in Mansfield um, might look very different to innovation in New York. So sometimes people f think that um, a light night, for example, in Nashville might not, isn't, not might not, isn't in innovative, that happen all over the country. But actually in that, in that context, in that place at that time, it was, it was in as innovative, so I think, and I've heard people say, well, that's been all over the place. It's like, well, it's not been here. And I think um, it's quite important how you kind of frame the innovation or frame what's distinctive to Mansfield is very, might be very different to Brighton. I don't know why I'm using New York and Brighton as... <laughs> um, obviously, asset mapping and some of this going on in um, the way you can kind of understand the foundations that you're working with. This is all the assets in London. They've, they've got a infrastructure, cultural infrastructure report, surprise, um, which I think is really useful, but it's about what do you do with that. I mean, it's great knowing that we've got, I mean, if, what have they got? They've got 240 artists workspaces in London. Um, anyway, um, but it's what do you do with them and what happens within them. Um, but I came across this example um, the other day um, of an artist who's actually using her art to asset map. So she's asset mapping the artists in Birmingham, and she's obviously writing, writing, doing illustrations of them. So again, it's just quite nice, the art of asset mapping and how, how again, how you can use artists to maybe 
address some of these issues. Um, and she came up with a nice quote, which is, we all have the power to be a point of light, which I think is quite nice. Um, when we talk about cu cultural infrastructure, it's about the, the partners and the platforms and spaces and places. It's kind of moving on by itself, but it doesn't matter. Um, but obviously, that's about where culture is consumed, produced, nurtured. This wasn't part of it, but I added these at the bottom in terms of some of the stuff I read about nurtured, about the education spaces where people are first inspired, the colleges or um, where they learn their skills, where they craft their skills. And it's not often, I think that's really important that, you know, understanding those entry points for some people. And my entry point was picking up a, an upside down guitar and it's, and, um, and then how that, how that infrastructure shared because without people knowing, I mean, we get it all, you must get it all the time. We never knew about it. Um, if it weren't for that bus stop, we'd have never, we'd have never come to your festival. All right, but it was on a bus stop. So you, anyway, um, but it's about um, the, the communication and distribution of culture. I think it's really important that we don't underestimate the the, the market, the marketeers and the people who promote what we do, because actually it, in a, in a kind of very competitive landscape online with social media, we need to kind of get what's out there out there. Um, when I talk about building paradise, I was kind of saying what would the perfect vibrant cultural infrastructure look like and I just listed loads of words which every, like every probably strategic planner would include so it's not very exciting um, and that's open for interpretation and obviously that that's not for me or, or an individual that's for community but I think I'm quite interested in the the, the kind of dualities I think for in order for a an infrastructure to, to kind of thrive, I think it needs to be challenged. I think it needs disruption. I think it, we all know the usual suspects in the places we work in. There's a comfort, comfort zone. Um, I'm just making sure that I'm keeping up with notes. Um, yeah, there's a comfort zone and I, I think it's really important. We talked, someone talked about failure and pushing the boundaries. I think it's really important. Um, when I started in Stoke with this, you know, that's when a CPP had, they had three million pounds, which is a hell of a lot of money. And as everyone was just like, as I said, it's like being the rich uncle at a party where everyone wants to drinks off you. Um, and you like it, when I first started in Stoke, it was it wasn't a nice landscape to be in. But it was it was quite comf the artist network was quite comfortable and it was quite they just expected to carry on as it was. And actually, the point of a Creative People and Places program is in Arts Council's eyes to be radical. I don't know what that means. Um, so that's a nice quote. So I, I guess for me, it's, it's understanding what are the next steps. Um, I like talk, talk about like, how do you get people from apathy? So people just lacking interest, not interest in you, not interested in first art, not interested in your ideas to, to it becoming a possibility. But that takes time. And we know the first conversations we have with some partners it's like, here he is, another art, white guy with a beard and glasses in the arts, whoopie do. Um, but Yorkshire accent, who are you? You know, we, we're not interested. It takes time to kind of go, oh, right, we're starting to kind of be a bit interested in what you're doing now. And that, I mean, obviously, that just takes a lot of a lot of time. Um, and I guess it's like, what can we do to make everyone's good ideas a possibility to someone? You know, it might not be suitable for us, but it, there might be some. There's a funder or someone else out there who might want to listen or might who can do something with that. Because as I said, us as a program can't do everything. Um, I, I always kind of like empathise with the freelancers in the room because it's you know it comes up time and time again. I've been part of City of Culture bids, and they're, they're they're the ones who aren't getting paid, and it's like, what can we do or what can the, the sector do to support that? Um, and like, what is that independent voice for those collective issues? Who has the voice? Um, so I think that's quite important about what that framework mechanism looks like. Um, you know, I'm, I'm making this up, but like a, a Mansfield freelance associate, that's a really bad idea, it's just come to me. But you know, what is that, what is that mechanism to support, especially um, artists with, I'm, I'm know a lot of artists at the moment who've got children and childcare issues, and it's just the, the systems against that, and we're going to lose some really good people. Um, 
trade-offs is important. People keep saying to us, well, why don't you start selling tickets and become more commercially focused? But there's a, the trade-off is then where the social or kind of cultural con consequences of that, that actually the people we want to engage don't engage with us because we're charging £50 for a reef-making workshop. or we, And then we'll get the people at the, the high, high engages. Um, I think this is really important that the, the spaces, Mansfield, Ashfield, all these places, um, it's about turning the problems into solutions. There's lots of issues, sobering statistics around health and well-being, um, loads of empty shops, um, lack of arts, arts council investment, but, but they're all opportunities to kind of do something about it. Whereas, you know, um, la lack of competition in terms of art forms is, you know, there's, there's loads of opportunity in these areas to do something. Um, you know, like, uh, like I mentioned, we work across four districts. It's a problem. We have to spread ourselves quite thinly, but at the same time, I can have the same conversation with four people and hopefully one person will say yes and we can kind of build stuff around that. Um, and like, I think search, searching for patterns as well. It's like once, once you start get, getting out there and understanding the, the landscape, um, it's much easier to kind of put like join the dots. Uh, yeah, so this this is a bit of a frustration of mine about the compartmentalization of agendas. So you go and speak to children and young people team, and this isn't about local authorities, but it often does, is led by local authorities. Um, you go and speak to children and young people team, and then you go and speak to the green spaces team, and really just try to do the same thing. It's like, why can't we just have a a broader conversation about play in community or so it's about how we reframe conversations and connect obviously we spend a lot of time and energy having the same conversation so I, I feel more can be it sounds a bit artified doesn't it? it's like let's have a conversation about play but that's how I feel some of these conversations could you know what does um what does that look like or um like joining up that the kind of like that department division within um, councils and breaking down those structures a little bit. A good example of that is in Clare Cross, there's a group called the Clare Cross Healthy Futures Group, which is basically a healthy future can cover everything. And I think that's a really nice group because we're not there talking about one specific issue. We can all contribute to a healthy future and we can all interpret what that means. So. A quite, it's a, it's a really good network and it's led by the council, but it's a really useful network because we can easily fit into that. Um, we can argue, we can easily argue that arts and culture should be part of someone's healthy future. Whereas if, um, yeah. Obviously pooling has, assets. Um, what we sp spoke about earlier and taking risks, I think it's really important that it's, and to convince people why staying put is more dangerous than taking a leap. Some. <sighs> I keep wanting to buy a shipping container and do something in the community, but the forces that be kind of won't allow me to. I think they've kind of done and gone, aren't they, shipping containers? But anyway, my point being that in a room of councillors and people, me mentioned shipping containers, well, I might as well, I don't know what I might as well have done, but it wasn't a nice look that I got. Um, so it's really hard to come, if you've got an idea, it's, it's really hard to get people to imagine that, um, but it takes time. Um, so obviously seek innovation and try new things even if they end in failure. And that impetus and momentum, sometimes you kind of feel like someone or something's happening and you need to kind of get on there quick and get build on that momentum. Um, but you can't always find it. So in terms of our commitment, we it's a really naff name. I'm gonna come up with a nice and sexy name than cultural development surgery. Um, it's a really rough name, actually. Um, but we, it was what we were talking about earlier. We, we realised that we didn't, we weren't creating the spaces to talk to artists and people, and creating that level playing field. So that was really important for us. Um, we have festivals, and we need to start looking at how we can nurture and develop talent in the area. We do bring a lot of stuff in from the outside, which is beneficial. I, I would argue that, and audiences would also argue that. But we also need to be aware that why aren't we getting more local? Uh, and what we can do about it. So it's always like uh, looking at an issue and going, right, we need to do something about this. Um, I'll talk about what can is in a minute. Give artists like workshops and masterclasses. We have an empty shop in Mansfield um, 
in Four Seasons shop, Shopping Centre now. So there's an opportunity to do workshops and develop and listen to artists, basically, and see what they want to do. Um, we've got a producing programme, which is about how we can support local producers. Um, another thing is that all of our team are from outside the area. So we have to you know, flag that up. Why is a director of a CPP programme living? I live in Birmingham, by the way. Don't shoot me. Um, but it's an issue. And I, I will hold my hand up and say, why, why aren't more people? Why, why isn't a local person? I'm not saying that I'm... I mean, I'm not particularly... Um, um, like the highest caliber candidate you can get. So anyway, but it's, it is it, it is almost like I am part of the issue or understanding, not part of the issue, but understanding that there's an issue with that and just having an open, uh, not being afraid to have an open conversation about some of this stuff. Um, we are now looking at developing a cultural asset network. Again, we might change it, the name, because basically we, in terms of a practical sense, we've got loads of assets like gazebos or bubble tents, picnic baskets, um, deck chairs, which people have used, and it's like, how can we make that into a more um, share, like sharing economy? Um, obviously, in the logistics of managing is a nightmare, um, but that's very practical. But then, so is also the assets in terms of the intangible assets that we have as a as, as a as a sector, um, and it's just trying to build that conversation around how we can support each other and become much more of a complementary sharing e economy rather than often a competitive one. Um, and that's about how we acquire and share cultural assets. And as I mentioned, the tangible and intangible ones. We have a cultural enterprise program, which we've not really done much with, called Bossing It. We'd love to develop that with some local artists and people and figure out what that means. We have an empty shop, um, which is open to ideas. But again, that's really just about reducing that dependency on funding from trusts or arts council. And like, how can we start to generate income and create social enterprises off our own back? Um, and wash our own face, whatever the saying is. And then uh, just finally, like we, we have got quite a lot of data, which we could, when I say we could share, we have to be mindful about what, how we share it. Um, but we have got data about particular communities, or a lot of work we've done in Mansfield with the festivals we've done. So there is some data there that can actually be used by other, other artists and other people putting in bids. We have, as I said, because of um, data protection, we need to be careful, but we understand that having that data and having that primary data from a, a, a source is really beneficial. Um, and, you know, we don't want culture just to be a nice to have. Um, we want to, I kind of, I, when I'm sat around the table, I want people to take us and art and me seriously, um, which often they don't, because sometimes. Sometimes people like about class division and, and anyway, but that's a, a separate story and regional accents, et cetera. Um, but this really is just about the learning. I think it's really important that whatever anyone does, there's a way that it's evidenced and supported because obviously that's how you build and grow and protect the assets that we have in the area. Um, and I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Carl, um, we've got some time to um, have questions, comments, and thoughts around um, what Carl's presented there before we move on to kind of closing comments um, with regards to what we've spoken about more broadly today. So has anyone got any questions or thoughts for Carl? Um, yeah, just coming to Charlotte. On the way to Charlotte, I'll just say if anyone wants to borrow a bubble tent, email Carl. That's what I took away from that discussion. Yeah, I just want to the logistics of how to manage that. Okay. If you can do that then, yeah. Someone can have it as a cultural enterprise. Take there we go. So it's we've uh, yeah we've worked that one out today. So tick, <laughs> Charlotte. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you for um, sharing. Uh, there, were, there were two things that I was um, two thoughts that I had. One was around uh, when you were talking about food and the importance of having food, and that's something uh, I've learned not to underestimate the importance of hospitality on projects. And actually, um, yes, that is often a driving force that brings people. But also, I mean, one of the reasons I came today was because there was a free lunch and cake as well. And it's it's recognising that. And the best projects I've been involved in are ones where there's been that recognition and that value placed on providing um, refreshments and food for and with the participants, like the loudspeaker program I mentioned before, the importance of what, and what that brings to um, a workshop and to a project and how to include that in funding and that to be just as important as like the materials. Um, I know you know this, but it was something I just wanted to um, 
uh, share. And the other thing was around being an outsider and that kind of conflict and tension, but that sometimes I like being an outsider because then it flips the hierarchy because I'm not an expert actually of the place and the people I'm working with have the expertise and then that creates a much more um, cohesive and collaborative space to work in because I'm learning just as much um, uh, with with the people that I'm working with. Thank you. I just take things. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. <coughs> no, I was just uh, especially with the. I mean, we have we did some workshops over Christmas in the shopping centre and just having informal. Well, some of them were informal. Some of them we recorded it. conversations with people and just bringing their families in and being there for two, three hours doing stuff. Um, and actually understanding that about cost of living crisis, we're not just listening, actually it's, 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 they're talking about, I've, someone, I, I met in one store, I've got five kids, we go to Asda because they can get, I think you get three meals or a pound a meal free to feed your kids. And I said, well, if we had workshops and sessions, would having free food, would that encourage you to come? It's like, absolutely. And it's, but it's not, you've got to be careful not to kind of feel like being patronising or, yeah. but actually yeah. what you're saying is, what you're providing us, this conversation is really valuable to me. And as a transaction, because that's a transaction, yeah. you're giving me, when you're giving me, the information and, and stories that you're telling is really useful to us and actually it's in, invaluable to some extent. So the least we can do is provide you with a pizza or some food. And it, I think if people understand that, they don't feel like we're being, because um, some, some of the communities that we work with, I think they feel a little bit, um, like if, if everything's for free, like it's like we're looking down on them yeah. and feeling sorry for them, which yeah. it's obviously not the case, but there's quite a lot of pride in, in some people in those communities. So it's, it's, yeah, it's really important that, but I always say, talk about it, it's like, it is, that's a transaction, you know, it's, and then I always say food first, art second, well, not, maybe not even art second, um, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else in the room got any questions? Yep, yeah, has, just coming with the mic. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Um, I was just thinking about the, maybe from a slightly separate, or from a, maybe a freelance artist perspective about scene building, and in terms of, uh, I think about East Side projects perhaps in Birmingham, and what an amazing job they've done in many ways, and what a brilliant like, organisation it is. But then having, I think it's extraordinary people, the um, artists sort of. I don't know, forum or like group that you can become part of. I guess primary also has something as well. And um, just the idea that, that that would, that having something like that where you bring groups of artists together and they can share information with each other a little bit similarly to how we're doing in a much more broad way today. And obviously not just focusing on artists, but what you were saying before about um, commissioning or like, a, so for example, ESOD, I guess, does a call out every year for people from amongst its members pool for an exhibition. And I suppose it's a nice way of bracketing how you might be able to make those artist selections from a pool of people that are already kind of doing a lot of helping of mutual aid amongst themselves, you know. So having, I guess, having things like that can be super useful. I'm talking as someone who's moved from London to Lincoln, so I'm I'm not an outsider anymore, but I sort of am. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but I'm finding it incredibly frustrating how little of that there is, even in what's considered like a large-ish conurbation in Lincoln, like impossible to find like, fellow artists to a certain extent, because there really isn't anything that is bringing contemporary visual artists together. And so, and that's, if that's in Lincoln, I don't know how it's happening in Ashfield and Mansfield and places, but I certainly think like in terms of scenes like that, making mutual aid networks, which you can then have as a pool to draw on for other things, I think might be really nice. I mean, I think it's really, I mean, it's, it's like anything, once you work with a really good artist, you want to work with them again, and you do. But I do, it, it, it's an interesting conversation about local art, working with local artists, which I completely argue can get. And I, but also the, the kind of case of bringing in out artists from outside the area. But I, a lot of the artists that we work with from outside the area, um, it, it's about having conversations about how can we continue to work with you so you're actually bringing in or, or finding the space to kind of bring some of your knowledge or skills into the, into the sector to develop that. 
So we, you know, um, we've worked with disabled artists who have been part of our festival, but now we're having conversations about how they can help us develop the access provisions within our, our what we do. So, I mean, you can't do that with everyone because some artists you work with in the terrible, and you're like, we're not going to work with you again. Um, and also, just it, it's impossible to know what everyone, you know, there's people, artists, great, amazing people in in the community that we don't know about, and probably will never know about as well. Um, but I do. And I think we don't we just want to focus on artists. We want to focus about actually how can we create spaces where it's not just a group of artists. It's about, I love like residents community that we're working with and other people, maybe not counsellors or people from, but um, it's that, it's creating kind of that um, level. There's a great organised, I think they're in Austria called Walking Clouser, and they talk about the art of conversation and how there's a story about how they got the, and lads come sex workers? I think that's the official term. Um, sex workers, and there was an issue with, with um, that. And actually, they got everyone on the boat and everyone dressed, and the people weren't allowed to say where they were from or weren't allowed to. So it kind of, balanced, it kind of brought those hier hierarchies to a level, level playing field, and they were able to come up with a solution to the problem. I don't know what it was. And I know that's a bit over the top and far fetched to some extent, but it, I'm really keen on, like, you know, um, I'm not, again, I'm not pointing the finger to politicians or councillors, but as soon as they turn up in a suit and they, they to a community and show their power, um, there's all those kind of dynamics which I think are really interesting. I think it'd be great if we just create a space where we're not, as, we're not first out the fund, they're talking about the funds we have and this is how you apply. And, and I think that's, that, that's the difficult conversation because I understand that artists are all, everyone's always looking for money. It's like, Hungry hippo syndrome, isn't it? You put some money in the table, and everyone wants a piece. Um, so, but we want to try and create spaces where the cultural development surges is just more about. I don't know. I'm open, we're open to ideas for people in the area to understand what that actually might look like. Because we did run when I was in store, we ran something similar, but it was just like a. You know, here we are, CPP program. Bang, bang, everyone was just having a go, go, and it just became um, quite difficult place to be in because I think people didn't understand the, the kind of what what we would anyway you can't yeah what we're trying to achieve because basically everyone has their own idea don't they of what how the funds should be spent or how things should be done so it, it, yeah and obviously there's a, a new CPP a new CPPs in there yeah. in. Um, I'm sure you'll get that as well mm -hmm. it's just the way it's just the nature of the beast because as I said so if there's money on the table unfortunately it turns us all in, a lot of people into horrible beasts <clears throat> Hello, Hi. it's Lucy again from Lincolnshire. Um, I just wondered if anybody else had taken part in a human library event, because we had one of those at the hub just before um, COVID, and uh, they're a really lovely, flat system of conversation between individuals, and there's no kind of hierarchy at all, and um, we, we really want to do another one of those, so if anybody else is interested in, in that, um, that would be lovely. Come along and be a book, or a reader, or both. <laughs> Thank you, that sounds like a really interesting concept. Um, I just want to quickly say something about ambition, um, and then maybe we'll move on to closing comments, just because um, it was something you mentioned there, I think your comparison between Asheville and New York, in terms of a, a light night in New York being a light night in New York, but it being something in Ashfield, it, it being something quite ambitious for that area, for that district. Um, and I think that's just, I guess, something important to think about. And in terms of, like you say, working with artists from outside a region, you know, I guess that can inspire ambition. I think obviously it's important for artists to connect within their own communities and to inspire each other. But obviously people are inspired by people from outside of their communities as well. And I guess it's about finding that balance. And like Haz was saying, like if you can kind of, yeah, ring fence opportunities or money, I guess, for projects for your, you know, artists in your region or communities in your region or your networks such as with extraordinary people that's brilliant and then you've also kind of got then your other opportunities exhibitions events where you can be you know welcoming in different voices from different localities and I guess that's um yeah just a an interesting approach to ambition I guess it's about balance isn't it yeah I mean it, it, I mean I'll give an example we um the line that we had last year um it, it was ex quite expensive and um, due to the nature of the funding it was coming towards the end and Anyway, um, and we brought a puppet over from Stuttgart called Dundee, which um, people saw it's amazing. Um, massive puppet, walked through the streets. It was on all the lead images, um, and it's expensive. And, my, and I understand that might rub some people up the wrong way, 
but it did what we wanted it to do. But now we're saying, well, how can we create a Dundu, or how can we create something similar in our on our own patch? Why do we have to bring something like that from our, and, and, and and it's it's open. I guess it's only that debate and being really honest about it. But my argument would be that we wouldn't have had so many people. I mean, people were it was really busy. Um, we would have had so many people go to that event if it wasn't for something that was such a kind of um, kind of like high kind of art, not even high art, but something that was really stood out in terms of the imagery. It was a really strong um, kind of lead. Um, part of our program, which actually got people to come into Ashfield because we were we never done this before, so we were really not no, really unsure about whether people would just actually turn up. Never mind, you know. So we were really nervous about that. Um, and Liam over there worked, worked with us at the time as well, so it was it was it was crazy. And we got nearly said we got about six hundred and fifty surveys back from that. So now we've got loads of evidence to suggest that. That's what people want. So at least we know that now. And we kind of work backwards. We inspire people, and now we need to go. We can't do that. We can't be bringing people over from Stuttgart every year or from France. That's you know, it's not sustainable. So we kind of now, now it's about working backwards. But actually, that inspired. It's not just about artists, but that inspired a lot of people in the community as well. Audiences, people now. I mean, we're getting loads of emails. Are you doing a light night this year? No, we're doing it every two years because it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, but it's that, that's what we're, that's, I think that in some ways that's what CPP is about. It's about, yes, there are issues with what we did last year, but there are also loads of like, positives that came with it as well. Um, so, it, yeah, and all the partners wanted to do it, but it's, um, it's where we can get money out of them. So, yeah, I think it's, it, it, is, it is always being mindful that actually if I was a local artist and you were bringing stuff from outside, I'd be pretty cheesed off as well. But it's understanding why you're doing it and what the rationale for that is. Thank you, Carl. Um, are there any final questions for Carl before we have some closing comments? Um, yeah, just there you go. Thank you, Jody. Uh, Jody from Platform Thirty One. Um, it's more. It's actually we've done some work with Carl, and so we work in uh, Blackwall Parish, and we do very co-created work where the community get to decide what they want to do with the investment. And on one of our projects, we made sure that literally every artist in our parish was involved if they wanted to be in the work to make sure that the investment stayed local. But as part of that project, we put on trips to go and see like the light night, and we managed to get some separate investment to bring one of the secret picnics that um, first started done to our area. And then that started off, basically sparked inspiration with the community and the artists. And from that, we're now planning our own version of a light night for uh, next year. And yeah, and we do our own versions of the picnic now. So it's been really nice as an... Um, I didn't know that. That's nice. As, yeah, sorry, I was telling you now. <laughs> I haven't seen it for a while. But it's, uh, it's been... Sometimes it can feel frustrating when you see like big, you know things on steroids and some things happening like from outside. But actually, for us, it's been a massive like stimulation boost um, for us to focus on doing it inside um, local. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Nice, positive. Uh, uh, thank you. Oh, can sorry. I just add to that? Thank you. And also, like you say, Jodie, it's the, the go and sees, isn't it? That when you put them into your program, you might not be able to bring the artists to you, but you bring maybe a really good group of people together to inspire them and bring them out into something to see to see somewhere else where you have that. Um, international or you know quality that you maybe see in places like New York. I think that's really important. Not, not taking people to New York. I think we want to get that past that arts council. But I Because we have to. It's massively yeah, important to not. And it's not even about going going to see art. It's about going to other places and not just seeing the infrastructure that's in place. It's massively important. And some CPPs are like, oh, no, it's it's too much of an investment. But I I would argue that it's really. And actually, the CPP program that we're part of, there's so much going on that actually, as a, as a network, we should be inviting more people. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, thank you. Hi, um, thank you so much, Carl, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say thank you everybody um, in person and online for joining us today and for your contributions. Thank you speakers, tech team, um, Mansfield Museum. Um, just say, you know, 
on the topic of food, we've got some leftovers, so please do take some with you. Um, we'll be offering out to museum staff as well, um, so help yourself on the way out today. Um, we've got um, 10 minutes or so in person to kind of finish up conversations, exchange email addresses where relevant, um, while we're kind of getting ready to pack up today before the museum closed up shop for the day. Um, please do stay in touch with C Manning's Midlands. You can contact me at info at cmanningsmidlands.co.uk. And again, I will be sharing today's um, presentation and if you've got any other kind of questions for me, grab me at the end, drop me an email. Um, and yeah, what an exciting day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.